Chair Shields, members of the committee, for the record, my name is Jim Guzzi, G-U-S-E. I'm an attorney in private practice in Portland. I'm at the firm of Ball Janik. For the last 10 years, I have represented uh, homeowners associations, individuals, businesses, uh, in insurance coverage disputes. And this is both on first party claims and third party claims. Uh, I'd like to, uh, I've seen firsthand how insurance company practices impact Oregon, especially Oregon businesses, and small businesses are hit the most. Let me just give you a couple of real world examples. In the first party context, currently, for instance, I have a client who owns a small commercial building. The tenant vacated prematurely and the building was vandalized. A claim was made to the insurance company. More than a year has passed and the claim has not been adjusted. The, my client doesn't have the money to fix the building. It doesn't have rental income. And it's running out of money to pay its lawyer to fight with its insurance company. And after a year, its decision now is to whether it settles for pennies on the dollar because it simply can't afford to fight anymore. One of the tactics used in this case and in many others is to request information and document after document after document. And what I've seen is they wait until you find a document or piece of information that you don't have. Perhaps the record was destroyed. Perhaps you don't have it anymore. And then the tables are turned on you because you can't provide them the information and they claim that you're the one holding up the claim. In the third party context, similar things happen. Small businesses get sued. They tender to the insurance company. The insurance company either doesn't respond at all or denies coverage summarily. <coughs> they have a choice now whether to hire a lawyer to defend them in the lawsuit and a lawyer to fight with their insurance company. And you have to remember these are unforeseen contingencies which most small businesses aren't prepared to handle. Most small businesses can't afford to hire one lawyer, nonetheless two lawyers to fight with both the person suing them and the insurance company. These are insurance companies who have built their entire fortune based on slogans like, you're in good hands, okay, we're on your side. But when it's time to pay the claim and to protect these businesses, they're not there. I would like to address the notion that I have heard in some of the previous testimony that somehow this uh, bill, particularly 686, is anti-business. Um, in my opinion, in my experience, that couldn't be further from the truth. Um, and I think when we look at this, it's important to take a step back. There is a statute on the books which requires insurers to treat people fairly. Uh, ORS 746-230 is already there. And so when an insurance company complains that it's going to cost more if, six, if 686 goes into law, they're already required to comply with this statute. Insurance companies who are going to have an economic loss are those that aren't treating their customers fairly. And I would wager to say that if their costs are currently low, they're artificially low. The reason that their costs are low is because their current practices that we're talking about are preventing legitimate claims from being made. Claims that should be paid out Folks don't have the wherewithal or the money or the time to pursue those. And so we're Oregon consumers, especially small businesses, are already paying because of the insurance practices. It is also, I think, important to point out that what insurance companies are saying is that they will, costs will increase to everybody if they're forced to treat customers fairly. And us, in essence, they're asking that the cost of their bad behavior be spread among everyone. You know, there's a real easy solution to that. Insurers don't have to engage in the kind of practices that are prohibited here. And if they don't engage in those practices, then the cost simply won't go up. Uh, at the end of the day, nobody is asking to impose special restrictions on insurance companies. They simply need to be treated like all of the other Oregon businesses that are already subject to the Unlawful Trade Practices Act. And all of the other Oregon businesses that are required to comply with this statute, it's not been my experience that the cost of buying a car or buying cable television or any of the other hundreds of businesses in Oregon that are required to follow this statute, our costs didn't go up then. This is not an anti-business bill. This is a lifeline for scores of businesses whose doors are going to shutter if they continue to be treated this way by insurance companies. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions? Yes. Senator Marcin. Mr. Chair, um, 
How many states, or let's just put it this way, the surrounding states like Washington or California, Idaho, are they, um, are insur is insurance uh, not under the Unlawful Trade Practices Act? I insurance, I know in I'm most familiar with Washington. In Washington, sorry, Senator Monis Anderson. Uh, in Washington, there's the Insure Fair Conduct Act, IFCA, which provides a private enforcement mechanism for the types of conducts that we're talking about here. So there, I there are statutes in place that do protect insurance companies, ins ins protect insureds against these types of practices. And it's been my experience, because we represent clients in both wa Washington and Oregon, that claims are treated much more expediently. Insureds are given an explanation as to why their coverage has been denied benefits that their neighbors right across the border don't get. I, in fact, have advised contractors, as Mr. Vial was talking about, that they'd be better off moving to Washington because they would, their insurance is so important to them, especially with contractors who get sued frequently, they would be better off their bottom line and to the success of their company if they moved. So other states do protect uh, their consumers and especially small businesses, and simply we don't have that here. Senator, I, I can give you the, the number of states. There are 35 states out of the 50 uh, do not exclude insurance, the insurance industry from uh, legis legislation like this. In the West, uh, these states do not exclude the insurance companies. Arizona, Texas, Utah, Wyoming, Washington, New Mexico, Nevada, and California. Chair Shields, uh, Senator Anderson, it, and even Utah, which is one of the states that uh, doesn't exclude, has a very uh, much more robust set of statutes to protect the small business and consumer with respect to insurance claims. Our, our practice is Oregon, Washington, Idaho, Utah, and uh, Arizona. And in every one of those states, other than Oregon, the opportunity for the consumer of the insurance product to have tools to force the insurance companies to abide by the terms of their contracts are much more robust than they are here in Oregon. So bringing this back under the UTPA is just one step, but it's a very important step to help all of us understand here that, that we are looking at the insurance company's obligations in the same way. And by the way, I've not heard any of the contractors or um, clients that we represent complain that their rates are higher than what folks are experiencing here in Oregon. I just don't think that's a valid argument. Senator Przanski. I'm sorry, the gentleman that just spoke. Uh, you gave testimony saying that you were here and that we should have received some testimony from another gentleman. Leland J. Quay. Did, did, you, did that come in electronically or is it hard copy? Uh, I, I, I thought it came in hard copy and, and I'll certainly check. I was looking it. electronically, I didn't see it. Quite. Yeah, Chair Shield, Senator Przanski, I'll, I'll check to make sure that gets There's in There's some hands. stack here, it may be here. I just wanted to make sure it is part of the record, so. Yes. Certainly, thank you very much. Um, Mr. Goosey, how would you categorize Algenic? Is it a plaintiff's firm, business firm? Uh, uh, well, my I'm in the construction defect uh, group, and so that is primarily plaintiff related. Uh, I've been there a year. The nine years prior to that, I represented directly uh, contractors, uh, business owners, uh, and individuals. So I've been on, on every side of this, and it's the same issue wherever you go. Every case, you know, I've been in hundreds of cases where this act would have a significant and direct impact on the outcome of that lawsuit um, or coverage dispute. So uh, sitting on both sides of the table, it hasn't mattered to the impact that I think this, this statute would have. Okay. Thank you, Thank you very much, panel.